we are lawyers. <laughs> uh, we have two offices, uh, Piazza Bari and Annie in Rome, we are in the 20 September. We have now 103 lawyers in Italy, uh, of which uh, 14 lawyers working in real estate. And uh, in uh, uh, worldwide, we have 975 lawyers doing only real estate. So we are the largest real estate law firm in the world. That's it. <laughs> Great, very chat. Well, um, as Lucia said, I'm representing uh, research and strategy for RAIN, for BNP Paribas uh, Investment Management in Europe. And uh, just to give you an idea about what we do is uh, we have 20, more than 27 billion AUM in Europe uh, across different nationalities, all sectors, mostly offices, mostly core, but not necessarily only core. We are active uh, at 360 degrees. And of course in Italy. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Alessandro Fernandes. I'm the head of asset management for Sonai Sierra, uh, responsible for Europe. Sonai Sierra is an international retail real estate company. We develop, we manage, we invest in shopping centers, and we also provide developing management and investment services for third parties. Currently, we have capital invested in Italy, in Spain, Portugal, Germany, um, Greece, Romania, Brazil and Colombia. We own uh, 44 uh, shopping centers with a market value around 6 billion euros. We are also providing services in these countries and also in the north of Africa. Good. Okay. Thank you. Marco Comensoli. I'm heading the Hotels and Leisure Division for Colliers Internationals. Um, two offices in Italy. We are about 60 uh, people um, covering all the asset classes. I'm representing Hotels and Leisure. Great. Gabriel. Gabriel Pompei. I'm the founding partner of Pure Investment Management, which is an independent company fully owned by the partners, um, operating as a local service and investment platform for international real estate private equity willing to invest in Italy. We provide support, we work alongside with these guys across the whole lifespan of the investment uh, within the value add and opportunistic sector, mainly focused on alternative market. Great. Let's, let's maybe... Just start with you, Maurizio, because obviously you've got a sort of um, broader European overview as well within, within your role, but are also Italian. So how do you see um, the Italian market? We've just seen here from Simone some encouraging economic statistics, um, GDP growth coming through, um, unemployment going down, for example. How do you see, um, I guess, let, let's get your view on, on Europe and also how Italy fits within that. Well, I would say situation, let's say, fundamentals, and fundamentals in Europe are, uh, are improving. So it's not, uh, well, we've got GDP growth everywhere, even in Greece today. So prospects for, let's say, for real estate, for all sectors are improving, especially, I would say, there is um, a very good trend for offices, uh, logistics are doing very well, because as you know, of course, uh, uh, e-commerce boom everywhere, but, but all sectors generally, uh, I would say, is, and uh, we have, um, we are still in compression mode for years, probably at the end, at least for Prime, but uh, the same performances have been quite, quite good. I would say for the future, um, you have to think that the, the growth we are seeing today is mostly cyclical. It's uh, all countries are growing above long-term potential growth. What this means that, um, just to give an example, the trend growth for Europe, let's say GDP long term, is around 1.5%. Uh, around and today we are growing in excess of 2% to 2.5%. So it will be inevitable for growth to actually to slow down eventually, probably after 2019. But still positive, because what is quite important is to avoid a recession, to avoid obviously a situation like what happened after 2007. Positive growth is good for real estate, of course, because you keep your tenants, actually you get your rents, and, you, and your performance is actually okay. It doesn't matter if it's very high or it's actually low. Why possibly um, actually slower GDP growth can be positive is that the potential for increasing interest rates 
in bond rates is actually lower. Because we've lowered, let's say, potential GDP growth rate, the interest rates in the long run are also lower. So the, let's say the chance of the interest rates going back to the point, to the levels we had in 2006, 2007, is extremely low. So we are going to most likely to have a, a world with growth, yeah, not super exciting, it's obvious because we are advanced countries, but lower interest rates. In the long term, this is positive, of course, for property yields, because the possible increase in, in property yields is not going to be uh, at the, to the level that you experienced in the past. So the cycle is going to be much more limited. The other, the other thing is that uh, if we really believe that, uh, I'm, I'm still talking about Europe, but you can apply it to Italy as well, of course. If you really believe that the real estate today is actually the third uh, asset with bonds and stock, so it's actually a very institutional asset, the liquidity that you're going to see in the market is not only cyclical, but it's also structural. And the more liquidity you have, of course, the more pressure on pricing. So let's say, if we talk about interest rates increasing, of course, I'm looking at this, it's important. But I'm not too worried as I was worried in our cycles, let's say. This is for Europe. I would apply the same, the, um, same reasoning to Italy with a provision that, of course, the level of interest rates is higher, the buffer, well, we don't have the same buffer that we have in Germany with the Bund, let's say, at, at an equal level of... Uh, of yields, or the yields. But um, having said that, I would say core in Italy is still a, a possible um, viable solution. But there are quite a few, I think, but we're going to expand on this. There are different angles uh, where you can actually still invest in real estate. And uh, namely, I think about creating value, which is uh, really the name of the game in Italy. Okay, good. Um, Gabriella, just, just picking up with you, um, particularly on Italy. Um, so in discussions that we're, we've had um, also in London, um, it was consistently raised, things like, ah, yes, but Italy, very high youth unemployment, what does this mean? You've got all of the problems with the bank debt, um, it, are there really opportunities in Italy? How do you see that sitting here in Italy, um, in terms of the, uh, I, I guess in terms of the Italian economy and prospects versus the other markets? Well. What I, what I can give you is the, the mood of the international investors we work with at the moment in Italy, which I think is, is interesting because uh, if the same question was asked to me last year probably, I would still say that mm, most of the investors would be very concerned about, in general, the weakness of the country. So that means uh, big debt uh, ratio, the stagnant economy, um, instability of the bank sector. I had to say this macro concern does not any, any longer. I think that, of course, we, as Simone said at the beginning, we had to probably review this sentence after next Monday and see what will happen. But um, I think most of the investors we work with, and I, had, I, I could say that it is, works with the most of them, they are not concerned any longer about Italy in general. Of course, there are some big issues with regards to real estate that they, they, they are deeply concerned with, and this is one of the reasons why most of them, especially months ago, were investigating even deeply opportunities, and then at the, at the end they said no. And basically, the, uh, one, one of the most important is no availability of financing, or at least this is what they assume for entering into a real negotiation with you before considering a real opportunity to be acquired. The other thing is that they, uh, the, the deep concern is the regulation about tax, because it's huge uh, compared to other countries. So in, in every business plan, that it's a big, big issue. And last but not least, the thing that we do cannot provide to them is the development side of the job. So that there is a, a, a evident lack of developers, local developers who want to co-invest, put their own money into this. 
most of the time the question is, why are you proposing to us if no one, no domestic investors is willing to invest their money in it? And this is a big question mark. So the, the question is, as Federico proposed to the auditor, a question, why domestic investors are not investing in Italy? Or why do they, have they always invested in, in the same core assets? Long-term investment, of, of course, uh, in the back of most of the asset management companies, the SGRs, there are long-term core investors, but where are the others? So this is the big thing. Why in Italy the figure of the developers is not so um, evoluted as in the other countries? We cannot think of any of our players that have uh, a, com a structural comparison with the international developers. <laughs> Someone uh, mentioned Lend Lease. As a matter of fact, at this moment in Italy is one of the few international developers who are investing in Italy, and still is, it's an international developer, it's not a local developer. So we had to fulfill these lacks in order to be confident that the most of this money will flow here in the next few months. Okay, good. I mean, let's let's pick this up, Alexandra. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of detail in there that we'll we'll try and come to, um, but you obviously are um, an international investor um, who is looking at the Italian market. So, first of all, do you perceive any risk from um, from the fact that there are elections? Is that a risk that you're you're seeing? Or I mean, interestingly, when we were in both Poland and Budapest, three years ago nobody was investing in, in Hungary at all because the politics were just simply too difficult uh, for international investors to be involved in. Suddenly this year, a very big change, um, you've got issues with politics in Poland um, and so therefore you've suddenly got a change in terms of people's perspective about risk for Hungary and everybody saying there's a big opportunity there and they're comfortable. Partly, I think, because of the political risks elsewhere in the world. Um, but what's your sense of it here, particularly in Italy, Alexandra? And then also pick up the point from Gabriella of, um, are you seeing something in the market that domestic investors are not seeing? Mm -hmm. good, good, good question. Well, the, the momentum for the mainly retail real estate in Europe, and in Italy particularly, is strong. So. As, as um, Simon said, fundamentals are good, are improving. Uh, credit conditions also improved. Um, outlook is, is positive, backed by uh, an increase in GDP, decrease in unemployment, and we are feeling demand from, from occupiers. Um, of course, there are some concerns uh, in the horizon, namely all the, the local elections, but also the Brexit and the and the uh, likelihood of uh, increasing interest, ra interest rates. But at the end of the day, we believe that these concerns are not strong enough to materially change um, the good mood, the positive outlook that investors are having in, in, in Italy. In parallel, there is a huge wave of money entering or trying to enter in the market. So for me, the most important challenge is how to deploy capital. We are seeing uh, uh, huge demand from investors, mainly on the prime core, and um, for this type of product there is no, I would say, very limited uh, offer. So there is an imbalance uh, between offer and, um, and demand, and prices on the prime are, are basically increasing. So during 2018 we will have this tension between um, the pressure to invest and the feeling that probably there are some segments that are overpriced that we are uh, uh, late in the cycle. But this being said, we see in Italy um, very good opportunities. Uh, but for that, we have to move up the risk curve. So we cannot stay on the prime, on the core, where it will be difficult to have uh, high returns we have to go to the to secondary markets and we have to go to other type of initiatives. Uh, for example, for, for instance, we just announced last week that we will start uh, a development of a dominant shopping center 
in Palma, together with a local partner. Uh, it's an investment of 200 million euros. So we are clearly entering to, into development, but we feel we have to have the, this type of products for investors. There's no in the market, we have to build that. But for that, we have, as I said, move up to this curve. You have to enter into other tricky territories, but we believe that is there where we can uh, create value uh, to our investors. And from your side, you, you feel that you need to develop that project, product yourself? In a partnership with a local developer. Okay, but uh, development is for sure an opportunity that we, we, we see in the Italian market. Okay. Um, Marco, obviously yeah. you're looking at um, hotels and leisure, yeah. which you could see actually from Simone's um, presentation has been growing a great deal. Exactly. Um, uh, how much of that is, is down to international investors looking at the market and seeing that risk mm -hmm. doesn't matter in that sector in the same way? Um, uh, how, are you, how are you seeing that? Do you, uh, are you seeing a change in terms of the international capital looking at that sector? Well, I think um, uh, what we are seeing is that, uh, yes, a change. In, in, there is an increase. Uh, interest in the hotel market in Italy. Uh, the main focus remains still uh, Milan and Rome, but what we are seeing as well is that um, an increasing interest in uh, different locations as well. Um, apart from Florence, uh, Venice, we are seeing interest in uh, resorts destination. Th th that is a main change um, from institutional investors. Uh, what we are seeing is that uh, there are few uh, that starting from this year will invest in Italy, acquiring a uh, hotel, um, thing that we haven't seen for, uh, for the past years. And uh, that uh, is due as well to the fact that um, we are in a positive momentum of, of the, uh, the tourist growth, uh, depending on, uh, on, on several reasons. One of them is as well that the operators are structuring themselves um, uh, better, uh, proposing, uh, uh, having a brand proposition that, that is clear, that is efficient in terms of uh, revenue generation, but as well um, uh, cost management. Okay, good. Um, I, I wanted to pick up, you, you mentioned Brexit there, Alexandra. Um, Federico, you're obviously seeing um, the international capital that's looking at Italy, what they're thinking. Um, has Brexit made a change to that? Has that increased appetite for Italy? Are there investors who might have previously put more of their money in, into the UK that are now coming more towards continental Europe? What's, what's your sense of that? It's hard to say because I've not seen any difference at all. I guess that uh, uh, what we see on the contrary is that uh, uh, there is an increased interest uh, into the Italian market. Uh, I guess less uh, on, uh, um, let's say, uh, easy or simple st or traditional transactions where uh, I guess that there is a lot of competition for the good assets uh, because the market is looking at the same asset <coughs> basically, uh, and most of the market. So uh, I guess that now uh, international investors, in particular private equity funds, are looking to more, let's say, uh, complex opportunities where they can add value, meaning that uh, they, they buy distressed positions uh, and they try to build from there. <coughs> We've seen a number of examples of uh, uh, funds investing uh, heavily in Italy. I can make a couple of examples. The Voscolo Group and Mezzaroma, both taken over by Varde, uh, who has put a number uh, of, well, a, a very significant team on the ground and uh, has invested heavily, not only to buy the distressed positions, but also to put new money that will allow uh, this company to go back to, to the user standards, hopefully. So I guess that that is probably what uh, uh, is the direction for the future for those who want to uh, have some added value. Because otherwise the competition we see uh, is, uh, is just uh, um, a competition price uh, and not on the value. Where are the uh, Italian investors, and uh, especially in the value-added projects in development? 
and uh, uh, if I have to uh, put some elements on the table for, for, for consideration, uh, I would say, well, we all know that uh, Italian institutional investors like pension funds and CASE uh, have very much disappeared. I mean, their allocations uh, to investments in Italy uh, have stabilized, uh, to say the least, uh, always uh, pending uh, some uh, incoming legislation that uh, hasn't materialized so far. But nevertheless, uh, m many of these people are overexposed to the sector, and uh, when they are not uh, uh, overexposed to the sector, uh, they take a very long-term stable approach. So they just invest by statute, if I may, in a very stabilized products. So, so that is a trend. Second trend is uh, uh, because of the, the prolonged crisis, luckily we are out of that since a few years, a lot of Italian developers have disappeared. Uh, have gone bust, have been uh, de defeated by by debt, and then basically they're not operators anymore. And that is also another trend. Uh, and the third element is uh, that we all face is is the is the bank financing. I mean, on on developments, it is still a major problem. So I don't have an answer. I don't have a solution. But these are very clear trends. Uh, and uh, we all uh, concur that uh, value adds and development in Italy has a tremendous potential uh, because the stock is so old, but nevertheless, it's very difficult to convince foreigners to invest when uh, there are no virtually Italian investors to, to follow alongside them. So that's my, I'm not trying to answer, but that's my humble opinion and uh, a situation that I've faced many times when talking to international players. I guess how has that problem been solved elsewhere? Um, in some cases, I guess in, in Spain to a certain extent, the re legislation and the bad banks brought in that kind of liquidity and more of an appetite and capital. Um, you're obviously trying to get things through risk committees, I'm sure, also about investments. Um, I guess how is that seen, and, and, and is that a real issue if there is no partner or it's difficult to get the financing and there doesn't seem to be a commitment from the, from the domestic market? Well, it's much more complicated than that, but I think that there is um, part of my job actually is actually trying to convince these foreign investors to do it. And uh, I would say that um, it's not the easiest thing, of course, but there is increasing interest for this. Because uh, for an investor that is willing actually to take a risk, the opportunities are huge, as you said. And um, it's, it's, and it's um, to my mind, it's not even about any specific sector, but it's mostly about themes. It's just what you want to do, whether it's value added, uh, the opportunity is just a very general, general word. And uh, where I see, let's say, if I had my money to, to put it, what I would do is like uh, to reconnect to the presentation of Simone is uh, there are different different areas. One of these areas for sure is residential. For example, I would say that uh, the ma as the market is becoming better in terms of transactions at least, and we are still we are kind of seeing the end, let's like say the trough for prices with some uh, actually some rebound. There is, um, there is hunger for, for good products, let's say, of a high standard. Not a necessary last series one, but good product, let's say. That, uh, so development for residential is for sure one of the routes to actually to go through. And uh, possibly, uh, as it's not easy to find, let's say, the place to do it, uh, one of the and ideas that comes to my mind is to, to look at uh, areas that are not, uh, let's say, CBD, but uh, good areas in cities where you can reconvert, let's say, obsolete offices, for example, and extract the value just to promote good residential. The numbers are there. It's not the easiest project in the world, maybe, but it's actually worth, I would say. 
In Milan or Rome would be the best examples to my mind, but it's not necessary to be two cities only. Um, another area, uh, you, you were saying about uh, uh, stock is old. Actually, I, I got some numbers, and um, in Europe, this, let's say the percentage of uh, offices that are less than 10 years old, on average, is like 18%, one eight. Depending on the country, no? It's, uh, it's newer in Dublin because they're building a lot, it's, older in, it's lower in other countries. 18. In Milan, it's estimated to be around 10%. In Rome, around 5%. Which means 95% of the stock is virtually old. Exactly. So the 5%, let's say, if you consider new what is uh, 10 or less than 10 years old, the rest is considered old. So as you can imagine, the the space to do some hard core capex in the best areas is huge. If you manage to do it, you are going to extract a lot of value. It's, it's very where you have to go. Um, and I think, that if, if I may, that the last part is, uh, especially when I, see, I look at a city like Milan, is the regeneration. Regeneration of areas like, uh, I would say, I'm not sure in English it's the same thing, but it says Calofarini, means uh, something to all of you. So dismissed areas that need a reconversion and they need a, to be rethought, repositioned to create some kind of mixed, probably mixed development. And there is a lot to do. There are areas also that lost because of the development of a new areas like Porta Nuova, like city life. So the areas that actually lost out of this need a reposition. So I think there is enough to do, generally. And this is really not only Milan, although it's Probably the best example. Good. Um, yes, and uh, Alexander, yes, I wanted just uh, to follow up with what has been uh, raised before. Uh, and actually, there is an issue, a civic issue, which is represented by the fact that uh, most uh, Italian institutional investors are not acting professionally. Um, and uh, and I uh, unfortunately uh, they are managed politically. Uh, I can tell you uh, I'm a lawyer, so we have a pension fund, lawyers pension fund, and uh, I've been uh, uh, a witness uh, in uh, in free transaction in the last six months, uh, where in two cases the lawyers pension fund, in one case the pension fund of the Dottori Commercialisti, we negotiated the transaction. Fantastic opportunity, uh, core plus, uh, refurbished the building, tenant, long term, primary tenant. We got an agreement on the price, we got an agreement on the return. Everything was ready for signature, and in three cases, they came back saying, We cannot buy because the difference between the original purchase price and what we are paying now is too, diffi too difficult to justify because what? We can say on the press uh, if uh, somebody is asking why we are paying 30% more for something that was empty and vacant uh, three years before uh, has been refurbished uh, and uh, is fully let uh, to a primary tenant, that was uh, the justification. And I'm talking about this between 50 and 100 million each. So that is the attitude of some of our institutional investors and clearly if uh, we don't change the attitude and probably the people, we are not going anywhere. That's a very positive start. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why we have to look for foreign investors. <laughs> okay. well, just a, a comment on the um, rich structure that was mentioned there. So I, I don't know the, 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 the detailed picture of the real structure in Italy, but I can share the, the experience we had in Spain. So basically, six or five years ago, um, there was this new tax and legal regime for the Spanish REIT that to get together with uh, the bad bank and uh, with the uh, ancillary measures that were taken at that time that uh, motivate a lot of capital to enter into this type of vehicle. So five or six years ago there was two or three REIT structures. Now in Spain we have 50 REIT structures. So that, that contributes a lot for liquidity in the market. Um, also to the reduction of uh, uh, balance sheet, bank's balance sheet. So a lot of um, distressed assets come into the market and REITs uh, bought that. Um, there is a lot of capital from private investors, uh, uh, from private banking networks, 
uh, and it is really working well. So at this moment, time we see liquidity in the market, a lot of, of product was was taken out of the bank's balance sheet, and this and it's doing well. We have that experience. We launch uh, uh, um, a Spanish REIT called the uh, Socibi, uh, together with a Spanish bank last last year. Um, it was easy to to capture capital. So in six, six weeks, we captured 200 million euros to invest. Then we had debt. We are now investing. Um, and I would be very happy to have a, a rich structure in Italy. But um, it seems that it's not, still not, uh, not working very well. But it is, it is an experience that uh, should, be, should be followed up uh, uh, and shared also in Italy. And, and just, just picking up the point that we raised earlier, um, on the development that you're doing here, um, you said it was important to have a local partner, uh, which is one interesting part of it. Um, in terms of financing, um, how practical was it to get financing um, for that development? International capital, domestic capital, um, were there lots of options for that or was it difficult? It was difficult. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, if you have a good project, if the fundamentals of the project, like uh, location, some pre-leasing uh, size, are good, you can find it. So uh, at the end of the day, I think that uh, the conditions are very good, but it, 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 take, uh, it was difficult. We see the difference uh, now in Italy when we have a, a stable investment and you have a, a pool of banks trying to finance on the development, it's, it's still very, very limited. As I said, it will depend on the fundamentals of the, of the project. And if they are good, you, you'll have finance. Okay, good. Um, I want to drill down into some of the sectors um, and the opportunities. And Marco, just starting with you, um, the sharing economy has been one of the big trends that we've seen over, you know, over the last two, three years, which has changed formats in, yep. in office. Um, had a huge impact on the logistics market, for example, as well, um, the sort of innovation, new technology part of it. Um, what's your sense of that in, um, in hotels? How big an effect are things like Airbnb? Um, has that led to different types of product coming through? Um, what, are the, what are the trends that you're seeing, particularly here in the Italian market, but more broadly? Well, yes, uh, Airbnb has, has had quite, quite a big effect on, uh, on the tourism industry um, and has helped in shaping in different way uh, the products. Um, there are many new operators in the market that are, uh, that's created their, their product at around the rooms and are around a big living space, a big living space that is based on share, sharing economy, living space where you can work, where you can enjoy, where, where you can do many things. Um, in terms of, of product for an investor, what it helps is that they design this product based on the right fundamentals. So um, capturing good revenue inflow, having uh, little cost compared to other um, hotel products so that the GOP uh, is much higher than what a typical hotel could perform. Typical hotel could perform a GOP of 30-35%. Uh, speaking about leases, a good lease for a for hotel could go from, on a variable base, could go from 18% to 25%. Um, this product could, could, could perform with a GOP of 50% a higher uh, lease, so could go up to 30-35% of their total revenue and in these terms, what happens is that they can access certain um, products, certain assets that normally would not uh, be able to, uh, to sustain. Uh, and Federico mentioned, obviously, the non-performing part of, uh, of that. How much of that product might be suitable for... Or do you, I mean, how much hotels, I suppose, is in there? Uh, well, or how much yes, of that is, is assets that could be changed into these newer types of hotels um, which have higher performing revenue streams? Um, I, th I think, well, I believe in, the, in that there is quite, quite a lot of good locations uh, and that uh, part of that could be converted. Um, like one of the questions the operator that wants to invest themselves in the product is always um, 
is the building new or is not? Because what they prefer is to have a building that is old and that they invest, they put their own money to invest and convert it because that for them is less expensive than having a new hotel to reconvert it to the new product. And uh, uh, today is still a lot of new product coming on the market is not designed around new, uh, the new trends, the new specifics that helps the hotel having a better performance. So this is, uh, how to say, uh, having, a, having an asset, having an office during the reconversion into hotel is often for the opera these operators a better case than having a hotel to be reconverted into their product. Okay, good. Can I add something? Yeah, yeah, do. We've all been very polite, so you can just, just start talking. <laughs> yeah. Following up with, with several of the, the issues that arose uh, now, um, I, I think we have to say, to some extent, um, we. International investors cannot expect to come here and just find the same kind of standards that they have elsewhere. Uh, I think every country all over the world has got its own peculiarities, especially talking about hotels. Uh, there is a theme. Uh, probably one of the, the most beautiful countries in the world would not expect to have just 6-8% um, of big brands present in this market. But just because yeah. big brands only look at the four big city, Rome, Florence, Venice, and Milan, so no one interest, is interested in going elsewhere, especially resort places, yeah. seaside, mountain. Um, most of this country, uh, anywhere, is basically done by hotels owned by one single family that owns one single hotel, and the hotel most of the time has less than 50 rooms. So what I'm saying in a very provocative way is somehow if this country is of interest, for those who can feel this interest, I would suggest to try and understand how to cope with these peculiarities. Because I have to say, probably there are not so many situation of MPLs bankruptcy within the hotel business. I mean, for, for most of the yeah. owners of the small hotels, life is still sustainable. So, at least in my experience, we would work a lot in the hotel business, especially in the, in the low segment hostels and uh, student accommodation. But I had to say that it's very difficult to find attractive opportunities most due to the fact that the asking price is very high and asking price is very high because nobody in, is in the real need to sell, no real need of liquidity, no <coughs> urgency in this. So, and, and the other thing I just wanted to point out is the bank situation. Um, it is true, as Alexander says, in this moment it's, it's, it's quite hard to get a financing from a local, a domestic bank. Uh, all the international investors, of course, are willing to finance themselves locally because being financed in, th in their countries would be much, much more expensive. But on the, other, on the other hand side, we also had to admit that most of the Italian banks have financed everything in the last three decades, probably having almost no skill of real estate inside. Probably it is a skill that has been developed and now accumulated and now it's up to date. But at the time the situation was, of course, why not financing this with no real attention at the asset itself, at the location, at the project, at the business plan. So there, uh, uh, everything was done on a, on a very high level surface. Of course this is not correct. So we, I, I do think that in this moment in Italy, we are definitely to inherit all the track record of, of these investors coming from abroad. We are to import models that were and are sustainable abroad, but of course we have to customize and we have to cope with what we have here. We cannot transform this place in order to make somebody else happy. In, international investors have to understand which is the right level of return considering we, the, the existing level of risk that we can propose. Okay, good. Um, 
Uh, Alexandra, just, just coming to you, um, give us a quick overview. It would be a shame, given that you're here, to not give a quick overview of how you see the retail sector. Um, lots of discussions about retail where, particularly in the US, there have been big concerns about that. Um, how do you see that playing out here? You're obviously looking to invest and grow uh, what you've got here in Europe and particularly in Italy. Um, what's, you, what's your sense of that? Um, how do you see the opportunities in retail? Well, I think uh, the, the flow of uh, not very positive news coming from the US uh, is putting uh, I would say the retail sector in the red line. Uh, but the situation in the U.S. is totally different from, from uh, um, Europe. Um, in our experience uh, uh, so far, we are seeing these short-term trends, but also the long-term trends related with the online world, the digital impact. But on the short term, we are experienced basically on the dominant prime core assets, huge demand from occupiers. So basically, occupiers uh, want to be in the best uh, retail schemes, in the best shopping center, in the best locations, because they want to uh, have their, what they call now, their experience center. So they are not, they are not um, convinced that just shopping will be enough for new consumers. They want to have this experience center in best locations. But for that, they need additional space. And they are willing to pay more. So what we are experiencing that rents are increasing in this type of, of, uh, of assets. There is demand. Um, and this type of assets, I would say price is increasing due to this trend. On the other hand, in not so good assets, what we are feeling is that brands are not so interested uh, in increasing space. And basically, owners have to grant incentives to maintain uh, tenants tenants there. We are also experienced basically some changes on the mix uh, caused by also the digital world and mainly there are some sectors of activity that are disappearing. Uh, electronic appliance are requiring uh, less area, uh, banking, insurance services are disappearing from shopping centers, but there are other sectors that are requesting more space. All that is connected with food, beverage, uh, leisure, uh, medical services, all the type of services are requiring more space. So in prime core assets, uh, I'm, we are expecting an increase in demand. And on the other side, on the uh, secondary tertiary schemes, for sure there is retail uh, space that will be vacant in the, in the medium long term mostly caused by this impact of the digital world in the in the physical world and uh, are you seeing are you seeing opportunities then with those assets to reconvert them to other use yes so we are seeing on the prime we are seeing clearly uh, very good opportunities mainly to expand and make some reconversions from our portfolio for instance out of the five prime shopping centers four are expanding Four are being refurbished uh, with a lot of demand from, from new brands. In the secondary, uh, tertiary schemes that are well located, we are seeing demand to reconvert this, this, some space, co working spaces, some office spaces, um, medical clinics, even small hospitals, uh, if they are well located, are being uh, used uh, in space that was previous for, for, for retail. Okay, good. Um, Federico, we, uh, just, just quickly on this, um, we've been talking a lot about value add. Uh, Coimer obviously just raised 500 million for their opportunity fund, which suggests that there's capital, uh, particularly looking at that space here in Italy. Um, is that mainly for repositioning things from, from that NPL group, or is that opportunities where <coughs> the government are now actually finally selling off properties that need um, need some restructuring, some repositioning. Um, where do you think the big opportunities are in, in the non-performing loan side and in, in that value-add space? Well, the government has uh, uh, declared uh, 
for the last few years that they were going to launch uh, uh, a campaign to sell off uh, a number of uh, public assets or assets owned by public administration, but I've not seen anything happening, including uh, the few assets that uh, have been owned uh, by CDP are still stuck there since uh, probably five to ten years. So I guess that uh, probably there is uh, the intention to do something, but not the clear ideas of what to do. So for the time being, if you look at the real market, is, uh, that is just the potential. The real market is, uh, is different. The real market is uh, repositioning of certain assets. Uh, and in Milan, we have seen a number of examples. Ten years ago, I, I spent 22 years in Piazza Cordusio, our office, my, my previous office was in Piazza Cordusio. And Piazza Cordusio was more or less abandoned. Uh, uh, the building where I spent 22 years was, well, never maintained uh, for a number of years. And, uh, now you see uh, in this area, starting from this building, but uh, you can mention and you can go around, everything has been uh, refurbished, uh, uh, reshaped, uh, put on the market, and people are uh, now coming back to this area with a lot of enthusiasm. So I guess that the opportunity is there, the market is following, the prices are going up because uh, um, in the last two years I've seen personally as a tenant uh, during my negotiations for. Uh, uh, also for this building, uh, that the prices have gone up by 20% in terms of uh, cost of rent in the city center. I'm not so sure whether the 600 are realistic uh, to be achieved uh, in Milan, but uh, the 450, 500 are, are really already uh, a market price in the city center, which means that uh, people are prepared to pay for if they receive value, and uh, if you produce uh, something uh, of quality, uh, people, uh, there is a market. Okay, good. And Maurizio, just quickly, in terms of the, the cities and the locations, uh, in a lot of the markets in, in Europe, you've got a, um, that sort of investors gradually taking slightly more risk, um, has also moved from um, just fix and rebuild asset specific, um, but also moved to sort of secondary locations, tertiary locations. Is that an opportunity here in Italy? Most of what we've talked about really has been a few cities where there are opportunities, or opportunities at least that international players would be interested in. Um, is there a sort of braver, braver investor that should be heading to Naples, or should be, you know, looking at, at, at the sort of smaller cities? Well, we shouldn't. We should have. Uh, we should not have any prejudgment. Well, a priori, but of course. The, um, Investment in real estate is more and more ju just related to cities, not to countries. So it's cities that uh, outlasted em empires, outla outlasted countries, of course, who are the most stable and resilient product of mankind. But the thing is that the city is good only as, as good as um, his uh, positive features are good, which means that it's not only about size. I mean, you can be, for example, you can be in Mumbai and have been one of the largest cities in the world, but if you don't have infrastructure, the city is going to you know, have a lot of problems. So it's not only this, but it's more about opportunities. I mean, you have population, normally you have population growth, if there are opportunities. That's why. So you need cities that need to have GDP growth, but if needed to be innovative, they need, today they need to be green, they need to have good infrastructures, and above all, they need to have a, in advanced service sector, which means, or, or in some cases, tourism can, can be a good substitute for some other cities, but of course they must have a driver that promotes jobs and wealth. That's why people live in cities. And as we today, we have more and more urbanization everywhere, but also in Italy, still, it's going up. That's why you, you, if you have to pick a city, and of course, yes, we start from Milan or Rome, they are the largest ones, they are the most important ones, but you have to look at the cities where there is growth compared to, to others. And of course, the north, let's say, that is a much better position, on average, I would say, on average, and uh, than cities in the south. But we should really look at, uh, at granularities and uh, just choose uh, different realities. So starting from a minimum size, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, Federico gave a very clear presentation and uh, an outlook and uh, he left with a very open question. I'm not trying to, to respond to that question because it would be too difficult, but uh, uh, there's going to be a huge 
uh, wave of product being put in the market in the next few years from banks because of what Federico clearly explained. Um, what's going to happen with that? I mean, uh, it, it, it very likely that product is going to be very difficult and it will need to be very hardly worked. So uh, we all know that the uh, vast majority of international players coming to Italy are of a opportunistic nature. Uh, and typically they work with a three, maximum five years business plan. The assets that are going to be put in the market are assets that would typically require a longer uh, investment strategy. And uh, uh, we all know that uh, there is a, such a, a, a dramatic polarization in strategies in Italy whereby you either go from the very, very core to the very opportunistic. And uh, there is not much uh, in between in terms of uh, uh, products uh, and, and returns. I think there's going to be a huge opportunity uh, for those investors of a value-add nature that um, take a, a bit less of an opportunistic approach. And instead of uh, modulating business plans in the three to four years time, they expanding a little bit because that way there is a huge market to to address, uh, but a bit less of an opportunistic nature. I think that can be a huge potential. Otherwise, people will continue to approach those types of transaction on a pure trading uh, uh, strategy approach. That's my my, my, my thinking, but of course, it's much more complex, and it would be nice to to hear what the other people uh, think about that. Because it was a very, very open question. I, I represent a foreign investor, specifically um, for six and a models. In fact, that's, that's the brand of uh, the use of actually our capital is employed by the Dutch pension fund APG. So, uh, back to your uh, very open question. Um, Long-term investor, uh, so definitely not three, five years uh, investment plan. We don't. Uh, we're not looking for things that uh, we can turn around, as people say, and then, and then bring them back to the market. Um, at the same time, we're, we're global. We're about elsewhere in the world, uh, but we were struggling for several years to be present in Italy. Um, in fairness, the approach was quite um, reactive. Was not very, very proactive, which is. Also, probably why I joined for a few months ago. Um, from what the audience was saying, from what the stage was saying, um, it looks like in Italy the, the best things to do would be to, if you want to really be present, is to look at secondary locations uh, or look at uh, regeneration areas. But effectively, if you have a brand, if you have something that you really need to kind of penetrate the market with, uh, unfortunately, that is now, or, or Gabriele, you were saying, you have to deal with what the market is offering. Family offices, family family hotels, 50 rooms. Unfortunately, that is not feasible if you have a brand. And then if you really need to make your product efficient, because it's also a question of efficiency. Despite the fact we, we reach, uh, Marco, as you were saying, GOPs of over 50%, still, that efficiency can be reached when you have more than 100 rooms. So my question here is, is the only option, if we want to be in the city center, which I think is quite fair, especially if we want to penetrate the market, are there any options to actually unlock this asset? Well, from, from, from the TELS point of view, um, there are opportunities on the market. Um, Rome, in this moment, as Simone was saying before, is, is surely a market a little bit more um, open, more, with more opportunities that this Milan, Milan is still more, uh, how to say, focused on, on the business asset side. But as well, uh, in Milan is changing, it's not changing very, very uh, quickly or as quickly as operators like you would, would like to see. Uh, but opportunities, opportunities are coming to the market because as well, like look, location like Cordusio is, uh, well, I think I have conducted three feasibility studies for buildings to be converted into hotels there. Uh, so there are investors that are looking into the opportunities of, of hotels. Uh, 
difficulties that I see is that for, especially for institutional investors, what they see is that hotels is still a bit too risky compared to, to office building. And that takes a little bit of time and confidence for investors to, to change their mood. Okay, good. Did anybody else want to pick anything up? One thing I can add to what I just said is that in order also to, to respond to your question is that another question, how many hotels with more than 150 rooms do you know in Rome? So the problem is when there is a lack of everybody who wants to acquire those assets have to be prepared to spend lots of money in order to get them. The other thing is if it's a 200 room hotel in downtown Rome doesn't work, you have to be preparing to spend lots of money on capex in order to refurbish, to make it more efficient and so on. Another issue is most of the buildings downtown Rome especially are listed. So you cannot do much. Probably you cannot even couple rooms or other kind of refurbishment. So you, you, uh, that's kind of word that I use that investors must be also edu educated for, for this market. I mean, of course, it's your choice to invest here or not. Nobody, I mean, no one is uh, an asset allocation which is geographical. We have to invest there, although. In the, in, in the last few months, I heard an investor saying we will invest our money in Italy next year, quite surprisingly. But, but then this is the, the critical situation that you have. So, and the kind of education is also that you cannot consider downtown Rome only the few main squares. Probably if you go just a little bit farther in, in areas that cannot be considered real downtown, Piazza di Sp Spagna probably, there can be a business there too. So, again, I can give you lots of examples where uh, investors at the end say no, but as a local investors, or what, what I was before, I would definitely have gone for that. I would definitely stay in Italy, okay. and I would invest my money where we do invest our money as minority investors or co-investors, which is basically when, as I previously said, where we think that there is a lack of new schemes things imported by other countries. Uh, as I said, uh, in order to compete with Airbnb, we need hostels. In order to attract more international students, we need student accommodation, proper one, proper built student accommodation. In order to provide new couple generation that cannot afford buying their own flat, we have to provide private rental sector solutions. So we need new resi schemes. In order to have an old people community be more community than what they are at the moment. We have to provide senior living for micro living. So I think this is the kind of alternative that is this moment everybody should concentrate. Because again, I, as you could understand, I'm not such a big fan of the traditional asset scheme. Uh, I would definitely look into something else at this moment. I think the most of the opportunities are there. Okay, good. Marco, I suspect hotels. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, easy to say. Uh, hotels and, uh, well, especially new business models like the one proposed by Citizen M, um, there are uh, very interesting investments because they really focus on having something sustainable from the investor point of view and that really gives something better to the community, as was saying Maurizio before. Okay, good. Thanks. I would bet in uh, development of uh, mixed-use schemes, probably with a high component of retail. Also, redevelopment of uh, existing assets with uh, performance problems, but well located. So things that can be, through expansions of refurbishment, converted into near prime assets. And I, for sure, if I had the chance, I would like to buy a prime uh, shopping center in Italy. Okay, so anybody's got a prime shopping center? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is um, Good. Great. Well, this is it also. I could say thank you for coming to have <laughs> <laughs> But, um, well, I think I already expressed my view about, uh, you know, just create core. Yeah, create it. Okay, good. Very good.
if I knew where to invest money, I would not be a lawyer any longer. So, <laughs> that is the conclusion. So I guess that what I can offer is a, a coffee free, which is something that uh, <laughs> does not happen very often. Normally you have to pay for lawyers, so behind uh, <laughs> the door there is coffee and other stuff.